All right, hello everyone and welcome to Food Policy Storytelling, an introduction to harnessing the power of story maps. Um, I'm excited for this webinar today and our um, great speakers. So my name is Carrie Burns. I'm a communication specialist at the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future. Um, we've got some other members of our team um, here with, in me with the room. Um, Karen Basser, upper program officer, Rachel Santo, a senior research program coordinator, and Jamie Harding, our GIS specialist. Um, so today's webinar will introduce you to an exciting tool to help you communicate your food policy stories. Um, sharing our work with decision makers. Oh, I am sorry. Okay. Um, today's webinar will introduce you to an exciting tool to help you communicate your food policy stories. Sharing your work with the decision makers, funders, community members, and other potential supporters and advocates is important for gaining support uh, for new policies. Story maps, um, which are interactive online applications combining maps, narrative text, images, and multimedia content, provide one platform to develop and share these stories. With this webinar, we aim to give you the tools you need to begin creating and exploring these powerful tools yourself. Um, so I'm really pleased to introduce our two guest speakers today, Alan Carroll and Melissa Vatera. Um, Alan is the program manager for storytelling at Esri. He leads Esri's Story Maps team, which develops open source web apps that enable hundreds of thousands of individuals and organizations to tell place-based stories, combining interactive maps with multimedia content. Alan came to Esri after 27 years at the National Geographic Society. As chief, chief cartographer, he was deeply involved in the creation of the society's renowned uh, reference and wall maps, globes, and atlases. He spearheaded the publication of many new maps and websites, ranging from wall maps to supplement maps for Nation, National Geographic magazine to special projects featuring biodiversity and indigenous cultures. Um, and Melissa graduated from Michigan State University's College of Law in 2014, where she focused her studies uh, in environmental and natural resource law. With environmental science, a bachelor's degree, and a minor in agricultural economics from the University of Missouri, Melissa has particular appreciation for soil conservation and environmental and agricultural policy. Since writing the St. Louis Regional Food Study, published in 2014, Melissa works to support sustainable agriculture and local food systems across Missouri, which includes directing the St. Louis Food Policy Coalition. Um, and you'll also be hearing more from myself as well as my colleague, Jamie Harding, who's their GIS specialist at the center. Jamie and I are both in the food communities and public health team at CLF, where we focus on projects related to food system mapping. Our projects include the Maryland Food System Map, a free, easy to use application, incorporating data available for download on the food system, public health and the environment, exploring and assessing the Baltimore City food environment and working with organizations across the region to use mapping and data to support food systems work. Um, all right, and before I turn things over to our speakers, I'll talk a little bit about the technology we're using to run today's webinar um, and give a brief overview of the Food Policy Networks program. Um, so in regards to the technology, all attendees are on mute and will remain in listen-only only mode throughout the webinar. Each speaker will present their work in turn, and then we'll turn things over for about 20 to 25 minutes of question and answer um, following them. Um, at any point during the conversation, you can type a question or comment uh, for any of our panelists or, um, or the audience into the chat box. You can open the chat box by clicking the chat icon in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. You can choose who you talk to by clicking uh, the gray more button on the bottom right hand corner of the chat box. And finally, we'll be recording the webinar today and we'll send out a link to the video and a PDF of the slides along with some additional resources on story mapping. Uh, and now a little bit about the Food Policy Networks and then we'll turn things over to Alan. So the Food Policy Networks project is a project of the Center for Livable Future, an interdisciplinary center located at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. CLF's work focuses on the intersection of diet, environment, food production, and public health. The goal of the FPN project specifically is to build the capacity of food system stakeholders to reform state, regional, and local, local tribal food systems through effective public policy. We primarily concentrate our efforts on food policy councils and similar groups, which have grown rapidly over the past decade in North America. We define food policy councils as groups, 
Um, we do this through training, sharing best practices, networking, and other food policy groups and leaders, and developing and providing food policy resource materials. For instance, we have a listserv with over 1,300 participants, a director, directory of over 300 food councils across North America. We're also collecting information on similar groups across the world. Um, we have a resource database with over 900 resources. It could be helpful for efforts to change local, state, or federal food policies, and an initiative to connect FPCs and researchers to document existing and underway research on food policy councils. Um, please check out uh, the FPN website, foodpolicynetworks.org, and sign up for our listserv to stay up to date on conversations and activities across the networks. Um, and so from there, I'm going to turn things over to Alan, and he's going to talk about Esri and story maps in general and do some demos. So take it away, Alan. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, hold on a minute. OK, are you seeing story maps? Great. All right. Well, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today. Thanks so much for for joining joining us. Um, it's always exciting for me to to uh, to reach new audiences, and this is a really important audience to uh, to reach. So I hope uh, I hope you enjoy what we're uh, what we're up to and find this useful. So I'm just going to plunge right in um, and just give you some basics about story maps. And of course, I'm giving my presentation in the form of a story map because I live and breathe these things. At any rate, a story map is um, is a simple, uh, actually a series of web applications that combine uh, interactive maps. For the host, for the most part, they're hosted on Esri's uh, cloud service called ArcGIS Online, combined with rich multimedia content. So that's your photos and videos, sometimes audio and text, to tell all sorts of stories about the world. And by world, I mean everything from a street corner or a neighborhood to the whole planet. And there are even a few story maps about other planets. But I don't think we'll be dealing with those today. Um, they're hosted by Esri in the cloud along with those maps. Uh, so you don't have to worry about your own hosting, although you can host them yourselves if you'd like. They're responsive, which means that uh, we're careful to design our apps so they work on all screen sizes, from uh, PCs to tablets to, uh, to smartphones. And they're open source. Um, so that means if, if you work with developers uh, who want to do a lot of customizing to our apps, you can download the source code and, uh, and have at it to your heart's content, although that's totally optional. Most important for me, because I'm not a technical person, is that Story Maps incorporate builder functions, which means that you can build a quite sophisticated multimedia narrative without needing to uh, have any kind of web development skills. You don't need to know JavaScript or CSS or all that kind of abstruse stuff. Um, and that's enabled um, going on a half million Story Maps to be stored on uh, ArcGIS Online, and that number is growing fast. So what I'm going to do is very quickly run through the apps. Uh, we've got about, a, I'm going to show you about a half dozen, uh, and then I'm going to give you a sample of how the builder function works. This isn't going to fully train you, but just give you a, fl a, a flavor for, uh, for how, how the process works. It's actually quite fun, and most people are able to pick up the, the idea of the builder functions pretty, uh, pretty quickly and easily. So we'll start with Cascade, which is one of our more recent, uh, recently developed and released apps, although it's been out for a good year and a half or so now, and it's increasingly popular. So the idea with Cascade is that the whole screen scrolls, it's very immersive, uh, and it's very versatile in terms of mixing the multimedia content. So this is one we did in partnership with the World Food Program uh, on the threat of famine in Yemen, Somalia, South Sudan, and Nigeria. And as you can see, the way it works is I simply scroll down through the story, and as I do so, I see a real rich mix of content, everything from videos to text, of course, uh, and graphics, uh, photographs, uh, map, static maps, interactive maps, infographics, etc. So that's kind of the basic function of uh, Cascade, but it also has a separate or a different uh, function that's in, um, built right into the app, which is what we call the immersive section. So you notice as I scroll, uh, this map kind of snapped into place, and instead of the whole screen scrolling, then within these immersive sections, there are floating captions that go by. 
And so what I can do with the immersive sections is I can feature a series of maps like this, or they might be uh, photographs or really any content. But I can also control the transition effects between them. So this one just uses a kind of quick fade, but I could have a slower fade or even a kind of swipe effect uh, from, from one map or item to the next. Now I'm back in, an, in, a, uh, um, in the narrative section and then going on to another immersive section. But I'm going to move on quickly um, and just give you a sense of uh, what another story looks like in Cascade. So in this case, we worked with a photographer who had spent a lot of time um, photographing the borderlands along the US-Mexico border. And for reasons that I think are probably obvious, we thought it would be a good topic for a story map. And so we worked with her, her name is Krista Schleier, to create a really rich story uh, combining her photographs with maps that we helped produce and, uh, and feature. So again, we get the same, you get the same idea uh, that there are these um, uh, narrative sections mixed with immersive sections that give you this nice full screen view of, uh, of the photos and other content along with these floating caption panels, uh, which themselves can feature content. So that's, uh, that's our Cascade app. Now, the most popular app among our user community is Story Map Journal, and in some ways, it's kind of the precursor of Cascade. So the idea with Journal is somewhat similar. There's, again, uh, it, it enables a really rich mix of, of different types of content. But in this case, um, instead of the whole screen scrolling, uh, just the side panel scrolls. Uh, I hope the internet gods are going to be kind to us and things will load quickly. But at any rate, the idea is that as I scroll through the story, let me give it a minute to load. It's being a little sluggish. Uh, but at any rate, as, as I scroll through the story, uh, for each section of the narrative in the side panel, and I might move on to another story. Let's see if, uh, let's see if the elephant story works any better. Uh, as I scroll through this uh, the side panel and go from section to section, as you can see, you can configure the, um, your uh, story map journals to have the side panel on the left or the right or uh, larger or smaller in size. Uh, then as I, as I move through the story, the, uh, the what we call the main stage changes with each section of the story. So that, that allows you to, to do things like go from, uh, from one map to the next uh, to kind of compare themes uh, to uh, to have uh, again uh, you know a, a mix of content whether it's uh, static maps or interactive maps like this one is or or videos or even other websites or story maps uh, people sometimes embed story maps within story maps and uh, that can you can get carried away with that kind of thing but it's uh, it can be really useful you can also even within a section you can uh, have these what we call story actions that might change the map. In this case, we're showing elephant population densities. And you can see um, by the fact that roads, you see the road network and you can tell that elephants are better off if they're farther away from roads where, uh, where poachers might gain access to them. So this is the kind of thing that, um, that we're excited about that can combine interactive maps with content to really bring an issue to life uh, maps can provide the sort of context and information, a uh, really information-rich kind of environment. Text, of course, can be very, is very informative, and then the photographs and other and videos, etc., can provide a kind of personal or emotional component that we think is really important to uh, to these stories. Next on the list is story map series, and I've actually been showing you these uh, within a story map series. So there are three different layouts for series. This is the bulleted layout, so I can just go from item to item by clicking these bullets. Um, but another layout is called the tabbed layout. And so in this case, uh, you can see the layout's kind of similar to journal, but instead of a continuing narrative, uh, you can uh, users can click from one tab to the next. And of course, the advantage of the tabbed perhaps over the bulleted uh, layout is that you can see the actual categories here um, from, from one tab to the next. And then the third layout option for story map series we call side accordion for I think for reasons I think will become obvious to you. And that is that instead of tabs or bullets, we've got this side panel that behaves uh, 
um, in a special way. So if I click on one of the items here, I, the side panel kind of expands and opens up, and then I can read each uh, the explanation for each map. But again, it doesn't have to be a map here. So what we did for this story, uh, for some strange reason, is decide to show people the location of every one of the top 10 uh, most uh, most popular fad, fast food restaurants in the in the country. Perhaps not the best topic for uh, for food policy people, but at any rate, you get the idea. Um, then on to short list. Um, all the apps I've shown you so far, I've kind of specialized in narrative type storytelling. What we usually try to do is pr um, let enable people to tell a narrative story. But, uh, but give users the, uh, the luxury of being able to kind of wander around at will within the story. Well, shortlist isn't intended to be a sequential narrative. It's really a, um, it presents a uh, curated set of points of interest in and around a location or destination. So in this case, we're featuring San Diego. And of course, the items within a shortlist could be anything. They could be, uh, they could be clinics and health centers. They could be, in this case, uh, places to have fun or good places to eat in San Diego, or since this was done by a colleague who's an architecture and design nut, places to find good design in San Diego. So a couple of things about this app. There's this side panel of thumbnails, and I can click on it to, to access a more detailed description of each, uh, each point of interest. I can do the same with the map itself. Um, but one of the cool things about this app is that if I pan and zoom around the map, and I should have dismissed this first, as I pan and zoom, the side panel updates to show me just what's in the current map extent. So if I'm interested only in this part of town, I'm not distracted by, uh, by destinations or uh, points of interest that are outside the area that I want to explore. Uh, I can also kind of bookmark the story and, and uh, uh, the map and go from place to place with the same kind of effect. Uh, next, I'm going to move on to crowdsource. And this is one of our more recent efforts. It's out in beta, but it's uh, being used by lots of people. And it's, uh, you know, it's quite a stable and robust app. So the, the basic idea here is, that, is to recruit viewers as part of the story. Um, so um, if you can, you, you can just like shortlist, you can go to the story and explore uh, what people have already submitted. So this was a collaboration we did with, with the International League of Conservation Photographers who wanted to enable people to share their places in nature that, uh, that they felt uh, um, inspired by or excited about or feel that's important to, to their own experience. So you can explore these different places, but if you think, gee, this is cool, I've got a place I want to share I just go up here to this big blue button, and you can, of course, customize the wording within the button. Uh, but then that allows you to sign in with your social media account or with Esri's platform or just continue as a guest. And all you do is drag and drop a picture, fill out a title, add some location information uh, and a description uh, and a couple of other items. This is a slightly customized version. Then if I've done that, I accept the terms and conditions and submit the photo. Now what happens, two, two things can happen at that point. It might appear instantly or it might appear only after the author or administrator of the story has approved it. And of course, as an author, you can set your preferences for one or the other. We like the idea of sort of instant uh, gratification and having people immediately see their submissions but if you're concerned about inappropriate content, then you can, you can wait and review things before they're displayed. Um, just very quickly, here's another example of a crowdsource uh, done by a colleague at Esri who several years ago lost his brother to an op opioid overdose. And this is perhaps the most uh, emotionally affecting uh, story map in our whole uh, collection. Uh, but the basic idea was to use this crowdsource app to enable people to essentially uh, share their memories and tributes to loved ones that they have lost due to uh, opioid overdoses. And as you can see, there are hundreds of submissions at this point for that. Finally, uh, actually kind of going back in time to the first app that we released and we're in the process of updating this is Map Tour. 
And it's a relatively simple, the idea is relatively simple. So this is really a, just a series of uh, geotagged photos or videos that uh, enable you to give a tour of a place. Um, so you can, in this case, go from point to point on the Stanford campus, see a photograph, uh, see a description, and link to more information about that building or, or location. Um, we're, we feel that this is looking a little long in the tooth in terms of design and also the, our, the builder functions a little out of date. So we're in the process of updating this as, and we're gonna release a beta version of a completely redesigned map tour shortly. And I can give you a little preview of that, um, which we did. This is one we did. We did a prototype in partnership with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And this is a little unusual in that it's a tour of a specific of a single house rather than a neighborhood or city or you name it. But what we've done here is that we've separated the map, the image, and the caption. One of the problems with the earlier version of this app was that the caption overlaps the image. So if the text was long, it can actually cover up the image, which isn't very cool. So this is one of the layouts that we plan to, uh, to release for the new map tour. And then another one uses a, a, a simple kind of scroll action. So same idea, a, a series of geotagged images um, that you can can go through, but in this case, you do it by scrolling. But in both situations, you can still fully interact with the map and wander around and find other spots to go to if you want. Um, that's pretty much uh, a quick tour of our uh, of our apps. Um, very quickly, I just wanted to show you our website. It's at storymaps.arcgis.com, and it has lots and lots of resources. Uh, we have a sort of gallery of current uh, and recent story maps that we think are cool right on the home page. We have a much larger gallery that we uh, that we curate uh, that you can filter in several ways. So you can just use it to get general inspiration from hundreds of story maps about uh, good storytelling techniques and ideas. You can also filter the gallery by the different type of app or subject matter or industry or even the format, whether it's full screen or embedded or whatever. Um, and by the way, all our story maps are very easily embeddable in directly in websites. And we see that all the time. Uh, finally, as I promised, I'm going to give you just a little hint of the builder function. So this is a story map, actually a draft story map that's since been superseded by another story that the, uh, uh, that the outdoor um, outdoor partnership uh, launched just today. Uh, but because I kind of authored this draft, uh, when I open the story, I see these buttons. So this button um, is what we call my stories. And every time I open the app, every time I open this story rather, it parses the whole story and tells me if something's wrong. So if a map is no longer functioning or a picture has been taken down or something like that, this green button will turn yellow and if I click it, it will tell me what's wrong and even offer suggestions for how to fix it. But maybe more importantly is this edit button. So again, people, other people coming to this story won't see this button, but I see it and I can just go straight into the builder function. And so I can do, of course, everything with the builder from um, developing a story from scratch to going in and refining text. So for any section of the story, I can just click this blue pencil icon and that opens up a, a little uh, overlay box uh, with a text editor. So I can go in and I can, I can change the size and color of the text. I can, of course, edit the text itself. I can add hyperlinks. I can add within these text boxes, I can add uh, images, videos, et cetera. Uh, that's, these are the controls for the, the side panel. And then I can do the same thing to the main stage. So the item that's on the remainder of the screen that's sort of linked to this section, I can decide to change in this case from a map to an image or a video that's hosted on Vimeo or YouTube or really any kind, anything with a URL essentially I can, I can embed here. Uh, in terms of the map, I can, I can choose um, a map that I've developed uh, and hosted or, and stored on Esri's um, uh, 
Esri's cloud resource, but I can also um, control the items within the map. So I can set the location or scale or extent of, this, of the map. If I have, uh, and we often do this, if I have multiple layers of information on, this, on the map, I can decide which one to display, and I can even choose that, uh, whether a pop-up is open by default when people come to that item in the story. So it's pretty powerful and pretty intuitive. Uh, I can also add a section at any point just by clicking this button and it runs me sequentially through the process of first uh, typing in a title for that section, choosing the content, uh, and then uh, editing the, uh, or adding in the text and other elements. Uh, I can also organize the map. Uh, or it's the story rather, so I can just drag and drop items to uh, to change the order of the story. Uh, I'm going to cancel because I don't want to do that. Uh, and I, then I can also go into settings and do a bunch of different things. So with a single click, I can change the layout of the story. This is what we call a floating panel layout. Or I can change the uh, uh, the the position of that panel and the relative size of it. I can choose, in this case, there are just two choices, but with other layouts, there are more color choices in terms of the theme. Uh, I've got a limited set of, um, of fonts I can choose from. And I can also swap out the Esri logo for, for my own organization's logo or choose not to have a logo. And I've got control over uh, social media links as well. So it's, it's um, as a colleague of mine says, um, Creating story maps is is fun and weirdly addictive. It, it's uh, you you discover new new capabilities and tricks and tips and stuff as you go, and it's uh it's a it's a pretty cool thing to uh, to see thousands and thousands of story maps and the really um, the really imaginative things people have done with their with their stories and using our apps. So that's it for now. I'll ask, answer questions later, but uh, I'll pass the baton elsewhere. Thanks. All right, thank you so much for that, Alan. That was wonderful. Um, and everyone else, now we're gonna turn things over to Melissa Vatterat, um, and she will talk about her work in Missouri, um, give a bit of background on her organization, and then talk about how they have used Story Maps for food policy there. So, Melissa, I've got you off mute, so take it away. Great, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, or morning, depending on where you are. I work for Missouri Coalition for the Environment. We are a statewide environmental advocacy organization located in St. Louis. We work to support clean water, air, and also sustainable um, agriculture and local food systems. And so that's the component that I lead. I'm our food and farm director. And um, a lot of my time is spent, as, as stated earlier, directing the St. Louis Food Policy Coalition. The story map that I'm gonna start with today is actually something that was developed for MCE, my state, the statewide organization that I work for, but the themes I think you can be applicable at the local level for food policy uh, councils and coalitions. So I'm gonna hit screen share here. Okay. Great. Can you guys see this? Awesome, okay. So this is MCE's website, as Alan said, story maps can get embedded into web pages. So you can see that this story map is listed here. This story map um, is meant to illustrate for the general public as well as MCE's members, kind of break down two major federal policies. Um, story maps are really good at, you know, people really like visuals. So it gives an opportunity um, rather than someone reading an article or a blog post, um, you know, to be able to kind of sync, uh, cut down the language about complex uh, systems. So what we're gonna be talking about in this story map focuses specifically on the Farm Bill and the Clean Water Act. I won't go into the details specifically, but you'll see here, we are using the Cascade uh, version of the story map, I believe. And so we have a series of photos and then these text boxes scroll through. Um, and so we start off by breaking down some of the titles of the Farm Bill. And one thing that we make sure of in this is that we bring in uh, local components. So we have pictures from 
local farms, like this picture right here. And we try to tie it in at the end how that impacts um, people in Missouri, like we have right here, conservation in Missouri through the USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service. I think that's a really powerful tool um, that Food Policy Coalition or councils, excuse me, can use is using using these story maps to introduce a topic or you know an issue, maybe a campaign that you're working on, and then um, be able to highlight individuals that are working on that. So right here, we've got um, a, a farm about two hours from St. Louis where I'm located that we went and visited to learn about their environmental quality incentive program participation. And then we transition into the Clean Water Act. I'm just gonna uh, whip through this since you guys already kind of got a sense of how the cascade feature works. But what's what's great, what we have at the bottom here, it's very long, bear with me here. We have a list of action items for people. Oh, I should also mention my colleague Brad um, was on the was on the Daily Show earlier this year and uh, talking about the impacts that the Army Corps of Engineers projects have on rivers. So we uh, we included that here. And um, while it's not related to the Clean Water Act, it was another you know federal agency federal issue that impacts Missourians. If you don't know, Monsanto is headquartered in St. Louis, so that's also a component. Okay, we're getting there. Sorry, guys. So at the end, we were able to highlight after educating uh, individuals who are using the story map about these big federal issues, what they can do in Missouri um, and also at the national level to be an advocate. And I think that that's one of the great opportunities that food policy councils can um, take advantage of with these story maps. So let's see, what else did I want to tell you guys? Well, um, I think I guess I should mention, I bet many of you know this, that the farm bill, um, a new farm bill is coming up. And so we're excited that this could be one of our many educational materials to help people understand why the farm bill matters and how they can get involved. As you can see here, we started off with, with one piece about the conservation title, but we can go in and, you know, uh, modify these action items as, as the coming year uh, goes on. I thought I would transition now to show you guys um, a, a interactive map that we have that I want to put into a new story map. So uh, in here, this story map that we are working on, there wasn't a whole lot of map imagery. I think we had a map of uh, rivers up above, but this next thing that I'm going to show you um, is, the, is a map that would be the base for, for a new story map. So here in St. Louis, um, we have, I will say, we have institutionalized racism in the city of St. Louis. This is not unique to us. We know this is happening throughout urban centers across the country. And we've recognized that the places in the St. Louis region that are predominantly occupied by people of color are without several types of resources, um, one of which is food. And so the, the St. Louis Food Policy Coalition decided almost a year ago that we were going to prioritize improving food access and transit access in the northern portions of the city of St. Louis as well as the surrounding St. Louis County. So you can see looking at this map, like this is what you show, this is what you see when you come to this webpage. It's a lot of information. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this and put it into a story map so that I think I'm likely going to use, oh shoot, I'm going to go back and look at Alan. I took notes. Um, the type of story map where there are tabs at the top so that as you click on a different tab you can get different data so you'll see I'm going to click off these tabs for a moment but you'll see these are gradients for census tracts the city of St. Louis is here and then St. Louis County kind of runs all around it and so the northern portion um, is what we focus on we clip the data to just show that space but you'll see that a lot of the areas have um, high rates of uh, being low income and having low access at a half mile to a supermarket. So we would probably start by introducing this concept with, um, you know, whether it would be data on the side or running, um, floating over the screen. I haven't figured that out yet because I'm not sure which type of story map we'll use, but to kind of introduce the issue. And then we can pop in um, our bus routes and our light rail to show how people 
how this is a component for access. And then we can move on and you know potentially show where food pantries are, where gardens are, CSAs, as well as farms. And then if anyone is familiar with um, the Double Up Food Bucks program, it's uh, run by Fair Food Network. It's, it's a program that's developed as a result of FINI, the Food Insecurity Nutrition Incentive Program. And so we, we are very fortunate that we have a large grant here in the St. Louis region and across Missouri to have Double Up Food Bucks be available at many stores um, and farmers markets to um, essentially give a two for one deal for SNAP users on locally grown fruits and vegetables. So I, I think that's all I've got for now, and I'm, I'm open to questions um, unless, unless I've missed something that the center would like me to address. All right, thank you so much, Melissa. Um, so I think we'll hold off until um, the end. Jamie and myself have just a little bit more to share with everyone, and then we'll turn over, things over to Q&A, and I know Quite a few people are asking about cost to access this, and Jamie's going to cover that in just a few minutes. We've got a few different options for folks, and I think you'll be happy to know that one of them is no cost. So um, that's great. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about a couple maps that we've created um, at the center that utilize some of the tools that Alan and Melissa have both talked about. Um, Jamie will talk a little bit more about specifics for accessing um, story maps and creating accounts and things like that. And then we'll turn things over and have some Q&A with everyone. So again, thank you, Alan and Melissa, and we'll hear more from you shortly. Uh, so let me just share my screen once more. And all right. So this may look a little familiar um, as Alan did highlight this map briefly um, in his presentation. But this map here is our what does Maryland food policy mean map? And we created the story map, which highlights um, we've got eight different food councils in the state of Maryland, all in different geographic areas, covering everything from a very specific city to entire regions of the state. And they're all at very different stages. They're doing many different types of policy work or even doing programs that needed different policies and legislation to pass in order for them to be put in place. So we really wanted to highlight all of those different stories. We made this map um, for a few reasons. I wanted to showcase the wide range of food policy in the state of Maryland um, to provide a council of uh, our council partners um, a way to share the work that they're doing and their partner and other food councils are doing with all of their different audiences. Um, and we also wanted to provide an opportunity for other food councils to see examples of food policy work and to have some resources um, available to them to replicate some of the relevant um, policies or programs in their geographic areas. Um, and so we created this map. I'll walk through it um, very briefly so you can see some of the different components that we used. Um, but we created it, we've shared it through the Food Policy Network's resource, um, uh, database. We've uh, shared it with the listserv. We've shared it on social media and then our partner organizations have been sharing this in their networks as well. So it's gotten um, a really great wide reach and we've gotten a very positive response with that, this. Um, so some of the, the nitty gritty details about the story map itself. Um, we use the story map series, um, the tab layout option, as Alan mentioned, so that you can click through. Um, we started off with a um, general overview of the state. And then we moved on to the work that was happening in our specific counties in Maryland. Um, and what we did was we created map journals for each of the um, counties that we wanted to highlight and we embedded those in the story map series layout. Um, and this is maybe a little bit more advanced than some of you may want to start with for your first foray into story maps, but it was a way for us to effectively tell some longer stories for each of these different geographic areas, which was, um, I think, very effective, but we had had some experience creating story maps ourselves before we got into this. Um, so we have one, uh, many different stories covering many different topics, um, ranging from in Anne Arundel County, they uh, worked with, uh, they had a farmer's market um, running at a middle school in conjunction with summer meals programs to a supermarket tax incentive in Baltimore City. 
Um, and just to quickly run through one of these examples um, in Baltimore, we for each for each county or for each food policy council, we gave a brief overview of either either the policy um, itself or the program that was made effective or possible through a piece of legislation. Um, we then gave a bit of background for the impetus for why this policy or program ended up being important or necessary. So in this case, we're talking about supermarket or grocery store tax incentives in the city of Baltimore. And the reason that that was important is because in Baltimore City, healthy food access is something that we have a challenge with. Um, then we go on for some of the reasons that we were they were able to put this policy or the program in place. We talk about some of the challenges that the Food Council encountered and how they were able to successfully overcome those obstacles. And then oftentimes there's um, different pieces of legislation that were already in place that enabled this work to move forward already. So we outlined that enabling legislation. We talk about the experience that the Food Council had um, going through the advocacy process. And then of course we highlight a bit of background about the Food Council itself and provide some um, images and also links to their work online. And then we close each one with some relevant resources um, specific to the work of that council and the topics that they were covering. And then we give some, um, of course, some resources related to our Food Policy Networks project in general. Um, so that was one way that we've used story maps um, related to food policy here at the Center for a Livable Future and we're able to bring our partners in Maryland into that process. Um, kind of on a, a different um, side of things, we've also created other story maps on specific topics. Um, so I wanted to highlight this one because it uses a very different type of story map to tell um, a very different type of story. So this is the story map shortlist and we use this story map to talk about the hyperlocal urban food system in Baltimore, Maryland. So we wanted to be able to showcase all the different urban farms in Maryland. And we've got about 30 different uh, locations that are doing urban agriculture in the city. Um, and then show the rest, all the places where their food was either sold or served. So we've got the restaurants where you can find their products, um, the farmer's markets or the food markets where their products are sold. And then many of our urban farms have on um, mobile food sites as well. So this was, um, this is now our fourth iteration of creating and sharing this map and it's shared um, quite widely and uh, yes, yeah, so you can um, interact with the very specific points. So this is our urban farms. You can click on any location. You can get a little bit more information about the farm. You can see a link to their website. If you wanted to zoom in on a very specific location and see what's available near you, you could do that. And you'll see that this menu here on the left is changing to reflect um, the locations that are in view there. You can also click on the, um, the picture on the left itself to learn more information about that farm. Um, so it's a really um, powerful tool. It's also really mobile accessible. So if you were on the go and trying to find a restaurant that served local food in Baltimore, this would be a great resource for that. Um, so again, another example of using story maps for a more specific topic and a very different um, type of story map. Um, and from there, I'm going to turn things over to Jamie and he'll share a bit more about story mapping. All right. Hi, everybody. Sorry get set up here, but uh, I know that after seeing all those great examples of story maps, you're interested in learning how you can create them yourselves. And as Alan mentioned earlier on, um, in order to create a story map, you have to have an account with ArcGIS Online. And on this uh, PowerPoint slide here, I listed two different types of accounts that you can get. One is a public account, um, and I think that Carrie made reference to that. That is the free account. And the second account is an organizational account. Um, and that is available via an online, uh, an annual subscription. Um, the public account um, is very easy to set up and I'm gonna show you in a moment how to set that up. Um, and the differences between the two accounts are such that the public account is, I like to think of it as a limited version of the organizational account. Um, and limited via storage space, um, limited on how you're able to, how much 
you were able to share maps and data and um, and some limited functionality. One thing I wanted to point out, um, Alan showed a, a crowdsource map and I discovered just last month that the crowdsource map is only available to you if you have an organizational account. And for those of you out there that are wondering whether you have an or organizational account, oftentimes if you're working for a local government, working for a university such as we are, um, you probably do, your, your organization probably does have an account that you can get access to. Um, and you can set up your own account and start making story maps. Um, and I wanted to say that one of the additional benefits of having an ArcGIS online account, um, once you set up that account, you'll see that you have access to maps and data that have been created by um, thousands of people um, and made, uh, shared publicly. So if you're looking for, um, let's say, information from USDA, there might be already a, a map existing out there with data that you can use in your own story map. Or if you wanted to use um, American Community Survey information, that data probably is already existing on there and you can just import right into your own story map. So how do you set up at a public account? Um, I'm going to follow this link here to the website. And this takes you to the ArcGIS Online homepage. And if you notice down here at the bottom, you see a sign up now. You can click on that. And then on there, you can hit the button create a public account. It's as easy as that. You fill in your information. Um, and then once you've filled in information, you accept um, your, your privacy policy, you can create your own account. Um, I am going to sign in to an account that I just set up last night as I was preparing for this. And I'm going to show you kind of what it looks like when you first establish your own account. So once you establish your account, you're going to be asked to set up your profile. Once you've done that, you're going to be sent to this page or to a content page. And from that page, you'll see, you just saw there, it says no items yet. But last night, what I did is I thought maybe what I'll do is I'll create a, um, a story map, a sample story map, and um, see what kind of files you have in your uh, account once you've actually created your web mapping application. Um, Alan kind of went through the process of how you update a story map once you've actually um, uh, started it. Um, but I wanted to take a step back and go back to the story maps page. And I'll go to apps. And this shows all the different types of apps that Alan discussed and we've showed you. Yeah. Sorry, we're taking a look at uh, some of the messages we're receiving here. I'll close this out. Okay. Um, so what I did last night was I went to a um, journal story map right here and I just clicked Right on the page, build. And um, I hit start. I entered the title. And then I started adding information. And um, I didn't actually, wasn't able to complete an entire story map. Um, but it's saved within your RGS online account, this public account. And um, you can always open it up and then start editing again. And then um, all your content is private until you actually specifically say that you want to share it publicly with people. So that's a great thing is when you're actually preparing your story maps, you are able to do it uh, on your own. And then once it's actually set and ready to go, you can share it with everybody. Um, now, um, I guess the last thing I'll say is, um, Oh, 
sorry about that, that um, Esri provides a lot of documentation, including um, documentation on ArcGIS Online. So if you have any interest in, in um, starting your own account and you have questions about how to do things once you actually start your account, um, you can go to this help page uh, at the bottom of the screen here. And they have uh, videos, they have uh, demonstrations, um, they have um, content talking about how to do all sorts of different uh, types of processes within ArcGIS Online. And now I think uh, we reached the end of our presentation and we'll be starting our uh, answering questions. And I see that while we've been talking that a number of you actually sent in some great questions. So uh, why don't we start with a couple of those? Awesome. All right, so thank you everyone. I will kick things off with our first question and I'll also unmute all of our panelists so that they're able to chime in. Um, so Alan and Melissa, are you both there? Yes. Yep. Yes, great. Um, so the first question um, is, how does uploading data into a map work for story maps? Is it in the same way that it would be with ArcGIS? I've never used ArcGIS online before. So I think that question would be directed at uh, either Alan or, or Jamie, our GIS specialist. Well, I can take a first stab. Um, maps you can create directly on Arc, ArcGIS Online, or you can create in, in ArcGIS Desktop and then export to ArcGIS Online. Uh, most of our apps now support a direct upload of images. So uh, in our early days, you had to have an, an image that was somewhere on a server and publicly accessible. But now you can just drag and drop images directly uh, into the story and it becomes an item that's part of the story uh, in the store. It's more convenient. Yeah, I don't have anything really to add to that other than just to say that there is uh, a lot of information via RTS online that you can um, access directly from RTS online, adding that into your uh, the maps that you're creating or existing maps. Great. Um, next question is, are all of these optimized for mobile devices? Yes, they are. So yeah, all of our apps are, are, are viewable on mobile devices. The builder functions don't work for the most part on mobile, but they're all viewable on mobile and on tablets and on PCs. I'll just add that uh, when you actually look at the app, an app that you've created, a story map app, um, on the desktop, it may look slightly different from what you see on a handheld device like a smartphone, but it still works works well. Great. Um, next question, is it possible to combine two different types of story maps into one project? For instance, using a narrative-based map that concludes in a crowdsource map. Um, and I know we talked a bit about how we've embedded some story maps into other story maps, but um, Alan, if you wanted to um, talk about other ways that you can combine story maps, specifically that crowdsource map. Okay. Yeah, well, um, first, you, you can't truly and fully integrate one story map into another app, uh, another story map built with another app. But as you say, you can embed a story map within a story map. Often people, for instance, will use that tabbed layout of story map series to present a set of story maps. But a big caveat is that uh, the experience on mobile inevitably uh, suffers as a result. So you can imagine trying to squeeze the user functions for two different story maps, one embedded within the other onto a small screen, a mobile screen, it, it causes problems. But that said, we see a, a lot a lot of people using, using that device of having a story map that essentially serves as a frame for other story maps, just like I did in my presentation earlier this afternoon. Um, next question is for the Missouri folks. Um, what are the metrics that you can share? How many people are looking at this map each month? Uh, do you know how long they stay on the story map page? Um, and they're interested generally in web analytics. Um, so I can talk a little bit about that too, but Melissa, if you wanna um, add some specific things for Missouri, that would be great. Sure, I'll add with the story map that I shared, I did go back and look. Uh, it, we, 
launched that in May of this year, and apparently we've only had 27 page views. This is not surprising because it's the first story map that we've done that is very policy focused. Um, and so it requires a certain level of engagement, someone who's already decided that big policy is something they care about. Um, but I'm, like I said earlier, I'm hopeful that with the Farm Bill being a priority this coming year that we'll be able to promote it more and get more traction. The, uh, North, the North St. Louis Food Access map that I shared has had 111 views and that has been um, live since April of this year. So uh, I don't know, I think that's pretty good. We also have a food shed map that shows all types of food resources within 100 miles of St. Louis and that's had hundreds of hits. So um, I think it varies based on content and, of course, how much you promote it. Yeah, promotion is really key, of course. Uh, it, it can vary, you know, story map visitation can vary all across the gamut. We've, we, we did a custom story map on terrorist attacks that's received hmm. uh, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of page views. A general fact seems to be that our analytics show that story maps, once people are there, they tend to be sticky. That is that people... People, uh, people spend more time on a story map than quite a bit more time in, on average than they do on a typical web page, which is nice. And that's certainly something that we've found as well with our maps. And I'll say that with our food policy story maps specifically, um, that we've had um, a few hundred people view that map. And the, there's a nice chart that you'll see when you go and look at the analytics for the story maps. And the, the peaks are directly correlated with us, either us sharing it personally, both through um, social media and our other communications channels, or finding out that a partner organization had shared it as well. So these are something that we found, um, the more active we are in pushing them out to our audience, the more um, uptake there is, which I think is true for many communications tools. I have a question real quick about that. Is there a way to track uh, analytics of in Esri, because I'm just tracking it on our website. Does anybody know? Um, there's there's some, there, there, I'm not a real expert at this and I should be more of one. Uh, there are basic analytics on ArcGIS Online, but it's also possible, and I think if you go to our blog page, and there are lots and lots and lots of blog posts with uh, tips and tricks and best practices, you'll find information about how to uh, embed uh, things like Google Analytics into uh, into web map into uh, story maps. Great. Um, all right. The next question is, uh, how can we create a food access map like the one that MCE used? Um, and we had another person also interested in something similar to our Maryland food system map. And I'll, I'll start by saying that um, the Maryland food system map and the, the map that MCE created to show food access are, neither of, are, of those are maps that were created using um, the story map fu function specifically. But as Melissa said, she's taking some of that content and using it to create a story map in the future. And we've certainly done the same thing with ours. Um, and so I'm happy to provide our contact information to talk a little bit more um, potentially offline about um, the Maryland food system map and what we've done to create that. But we, we have amassed um, quite a lot of data um, across the entire food system. And we are thinking about different ways of packaging all that information. We've got 175 different layers available on the Maryland food system map, which is a lot of information. And the benefit of story maps and what we'd like to be using story maps to do is packaging some smaller chunks of that information up and communicating that in a more direct way with our audience. I'll speak to MCE's map real quick. Um, so to be clear, at least it's been my understanding, so Ellen or Jamie correct me, but the story maps have to have a map as a base. They actually, actually don't. Uh, story maps no. actually don't. Um, they they can have images. They can have videos. Alan can. Yeah, we we don't. We tend to not. We tend not to not advertise that fact. But, <laughs> but in fact, story maps, especially uh, especially series and journal and cascade, you can build a you can build a story map with no maps whatsoever. Cool. Okay. Well, that that's helpful to know. I still am a huge map nerd, so I'm always going to try to <laughs> have it in our story maps. Um, but that map that I showed, that food access map, I will just say uh, 
we gather that data um, from community partners, so other people in the Food Policy Coalition or other entities that, that work in the St. Louis area. Um, a lot of the data can also be accessible from the USDA or from potentially, like for example, the SNAP and WIC retailers. Um, I think we got that from a, a state level database. I'd be happy to talk about it in more detail, but that's, that's where, where that data came from. And I think I saw a question earlier about how long the map took. That map took a semester to, uh, to build um, with the support of an intern who came in about 10 hours a week. So one other point about that food access map is that it looks like it's a use, uh, it was created using RTS online. And yeah. in addition to story maps, you also have access to a bunch of templates and web app builder, um, which allows you to fairly easily create your own web apps. And I believe that that food access map was a, probably a web app builder product or a simple uh, template was used to create that. Yes. Hey, one thing I'd like to mention real quick is that Esri has a, has a very robust nonprofit program. And so those of you listening in who are uh, work for nonprofit organizations, I urge you to go to esri.com slash nonprofit and you can get organizational accounts and ArcGIS accounts at uh, very, very deep discounts. Literally thousands of nonprofit organizations uh, take advantage of that. So it's a, it's a great program and we work really closely with a nonprofit team. We, uh, we, we know that there was a Food Policy Council in Southern Maryland that reached out to Esri and was able to get a nonprofit account at a fairly affordable price and they started creating maps on their own. So. Um, definitely something to make use of. Great. Um, all right, we have another question from someone. I'm um, wondering, um, once you create a story map, who owns that content? Is it public or is it organizational? Well, there are three basic settings for, uh, for story maps and really anything on our GIS online. So there's private, so only you can view it and modify it. There's shared sharing to organizations, and you can actually share to groups within organizations. And then there's everyone. And so once it's shared to everyone, it's obviously it's accessible to anybody who has uh, has that uh, that web address for your for your story. Um, and again, Esri hosts your story in the cloud, but it's your story. You know, we don't we don't mess with the we don't mess with your stories, so the, the content is yours. Um, great. So, um, want to make sure I'm answering everyone's here. Um, so someone is wondering also, is it possible to embed a sound file into a story map? And we have an example of a map that has done that. And I'll let Jamie talk a little bit about um, what sure. that was. We, we used um, the map tour story map that Alan spoke about <laughs> earlier, um, the old version of the map tour. And uh, we actually worked with a um, local um, the radio program. Yep. And they went out to a number of different sites across the state of Maryland and interviewed people uh, about um, food access issues and hunger. And we were able to take those audio files and embed them within our map tour. Um, and it, I thought it was fairly effective. And I think that, um, uh, you know, the key is to have a short uh, uh, a sound clip, maybe two to three minutes, um, because people will get tired and bored of what they're listening to after even a couple of minutes. Yeah, you won't, you won't find us right now, you won't find a sound option directly within our builders, but it is possible. And, uh, and again, go to our blogs page, which you can access via the top nav bar on our website, and you'll find information about how to do it. Yeah, and I'll just add a quick plug for the blogs and forums that are available on this topic. So I have created a few story maps now myself. And I am not someone who is terribly skilled with uh, ArcGIS or um, with utilizing, you know, building apps, building websites and things like that. And these have been something that I found have been very intuitive to do. And I have been able to utilize those blogs to go in and do some things um, that maybe aren't necessarily readily apparent through the builder. And they've been, you know, really, really useful. So just a plug for if you have a question as you're going through and creating these, or if you're wondering how to do something that's maybe a little bit above and beyond the basics, 
that is a really effective way of getting those questions answered. Okay, um, next question. I'm interested in using story maps as a reporting tool. Can the presentations be viewed by outside organizations and individuals, or does it require navigation or a presentation by the host? Um, well, again, uh, it, once the story map is made public, all you have to do is uh, is share the, the URL or web address for the story, and anybody can access it and open it and use it. And I saw that there was another question right above that saying, is it possible to embed story maps in a third party website? And actually, we've had a, a, a case where we, we did that. Uh, we yep. built a story map for an organization here in Baltimore called Baltimore Orchard Project. And they were able to take the link to their to the story map that we created and embed it within their website. Yeah, and story, story maps can be in multiple places, of course. So that Borderlands story I briefly showed was uh, uh, apparently it's uh, it's embedded in a half dozen different conservation organization websites. Great. Yeah, and then as Melissa showed in her presentation, her story map is embedded directly in her website. And that's one of the great things about story maps is they're something that is a very you know, quote unquote, portable tool. So it's something that you can send people directly to the direct URL for the story map. You can embed it right in your website and it is shareable on social media and viewable on mobile. <laughs> Someone is also wondering if there's a Pez collection in the background of our screen. And yes, <laughs> yes, our um, <laughs> Program director Ann Palmer has quite the extensive PES direction. <laughs> so thank you for that question. <laughs> if I could just add, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead if you're looking for another question. No, please, Melissa, go. Just thinking about, since there have been a few questions about the food access map, something I want to add that I've learned through doing those maps, which are critical sometimes for how you want to use a story map. Um, ArcGIS Online allows you to, uh, you can create layers and share them, make them public. So there's a benefit to ArcGIS Online that you can uh, search the internal database for other people's data, which can e make it easy for you to, you know, develop the, the uh, map you're looking for. The negative is that if that organization or person stops having their account, then you've lost that data. So that is a component of why the map that we made that I showed you after the story map took us a whole semester is that I wanted to make sure we had the data ourselves just from having lost some of this uh, like low income, low access data and some obesity data that we'd relied on from another user. Yep, good point. Um, okay, we have another um, question, I think a follow up to another one that came earlier. Um, but someone's wondering um, if they can allow people to search by address, filter by type of service, and then print locations near them or locations in their city slash town. Um, search, uh, search is an option in some of our apps, um, but isn't appropriate or, or possible in, in all of them. That's kind of a vague answer, but... Um, Please, uh, please, um, you know, email us or get in touch with us via our website, and we can answer that in more detail. All right. Sorry, I want to make sure that all the questions that have been asked have been answered, and on. Um, Please, if anyone's still there, feel free to continue asking. I see some new messages, so that's great. Um, so someone's wondering, can you share the URLs for the example of story maps shared earlier in the presentation? And yes, so I am planning on putting together a document that includes the URLs for all the story maps that have been shared today, as well as um, some links to some of the resources that we've mentioned on building and creating story maps on um, and I'll also make sure that our contact information is available for you who may want to reach out to us directly pertaining to some of the more um, detailed discussions on our food access maps, the Maryland Food System map, and things like that. So we'll certainly do that. 
And, uh, and my introduction to Story Maps, Story Map, is on our gallery. So just go to our gallery and, and type in um, introduction and you'll find it. Perfect. Um, so someone just asked, um, for people new to ArcGIS, what tutorials do you recommend to get the basics specifically about accessing existing data, such as census data, and importing those um, layers into your geography? Well, I'll say, the um, ArcGIS Online help link that I provided on the, that slide um, does have some uh, good videos, um, you know, 20 minute videos or maybe exercises to run through to help you um, get, a, uh, get sort of aware of what you can do with ArcGIS. Yep. There are also, as you all know, on YouTube, a million and one videos <laughs> on a number of different topics, including Esri also has a relatively new website called uh, that's, that's at learn.arcgis.com, and it's got a growing number of really cool um, articles and videos on, on basics of how to do things. Fantastic. Um, all right, well, I haven't seen any additional questions come in. I think that we've answered all the ones that are up here. So. Um, I would really like to thank both Alan and Melissa for joining us and sharing their work. This has been great. And thanks to my colleagues in the room as well for helping to make this possible. Um, again, this webinar is going to be recorded, so we're going to make sure that it's shared out um, for you all that have joined us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, goodbye. Bye-bye.